Good day, this is Terry DeFazio and you're watching Dial It Up. I have a very special guest with me today. Please welcome Miss Emily Payton. Emily was a candidate for Governor of Vermont this last election cycle. And before I, I say that you were on the independent party, please explain that you can't call yourself an independent or you can't be from the independent party. That's right. There, it, it, Vermont makes it very uh, almost impossible for the independents to represent as independents. And uh, the only time that you can actually come in the race is after the primary, which is kind of when people are in the middle of the summer and they aren't paying attention anyway. But you get to uh, choose three words to describe you as an independent. You cannot call yourself an independent. You, uh, those three words can't be Emily Payton independent or the independent party. It has to, be, you can choose any other three words. Okay. So I choose, chose the Truth Matters uh, party. I, I saw some of your signs, too. As a right. matter of fact, I saw quite a few of them around. Well, that's because we had a stimulus. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so this time I had some wonderful signs, and actually we're repurposing them. We're going to keep the top part with the Truth Matters. Mm -hmm. I've put a, a, a nice mask over the bottom, and we'll use the bottom part for some other messaging um, you know, primarily to alternative news so we can have an option to uh, show the kind of dissent that the mainstream news is not. Yeah. Um, did you enjoy running for office? This time I did. This okay. time was such a lovely run and uh, I think I know the difference this time. One big difference is I got, other than you and other than cable access that we did, I got almost no coverage. Like, no articles in the papers, no, uh, you know, I had five minutes on, and I'm talking about from the primary, you know, after the primary, I got five minutes on VPR and like two paragraphs from a Randolph-based paper. And that Randolph-based paper uh, really made fun of me. And as would other papers, it used to be more open that they would, you know, they would cover you but if they did, if you weren't a mainstream candidate and and weren't promoting mainstream narratives and ideas, they would make fun of you. Um, so it was always very hard to run when they were doing that. Mm -hmm. So because there was almost complete censorship and <coughs> ghosting, I should say, this time, um, I was just connecting with the people, and there was an urgency. So people were beginning to work on these people's assemblies and the councils that I've been talking about and moving into sovereign things. And the, the amount of love I experienced, even with 1% of the vote as the outcome, was just ginormous. I mean, the day I went to vote, somebody came up and I, and I recognized her face, didn't remember her name. She said, I just came out to vote for you. And I'm, you know, I'm getting shivers. There was, there was, it was a, a profoundly uh, beautiful run this time for me. Well, uh, that, that sort of kills the next question that I was going to ask you. It's obvious the mainstream media didn't want anything to do with you, correct? Well, they haven't wanted anything to do with me. Uh, you know, I started in 2010. I was total green, greenback, and I was talking about how we can uh, reform our monetary system for more justice. And then I went on in, in 2012. And um, after 2012, I, got the, I was the third place with like 3%. And so I said, okay, in 2014, I can't do an independent because they don't let you in the primary, so I will choose to be in a party, which you had to be, to get in debates. They just would ignore you. So the, the incumbent was a de Democrat. So there was the Republican Party. No one was going to run against him. It was wide open. He had, you know, it was Shumlin. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, uh, I, the mistake I made was to, well, they would have found a way to 
to uh, undermine me either way. But anyway, I got into the Republican Party. Randy Brock wasn't going to run. Oh, yeah, uh, we, we, we know Randy. Yes. Yeah, we know of him. Yes. He's from St. Albans, isn't he? Uh, he may be. Yeah. And there was Heidi Schumerman. I can't say her last name. She They asked her to run. She wouldn't run. Um, and they had no one to run. And here I was in the in the party. And they, they would have been forced to have me there. Okay. And so they, they, they hunted and searched, and they uh, found Scott Milne. Now, Scott Milne had never gotten into politics. His mother was a big Republican. Mm -hmm. And uh, they urged him, and he, at the very last day, they got in all the signatures, you know, on the last day, he agreed. He didn't have a... He didn't have a platform. He didn't have any experience. I had a pretty profound platform at that point. I had a lot of uh, activism experience. And within a week, Terry, within a week, the, the news outlets, this is before any poll, were calling him the top tier candidate. Mm -hmm. So they'd say, here's the top <clears throat> tier candidate. And they would just, again, ghost me. Right. So this is, uh, this, of course, this is a way of manipulating the outcome, but, um, you know, it's a, it's a big deal that voters don't really, I guess, don't, don't really get. It's, 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 not a, it's not appropriate the way our elections are run because there are good people with good ideas. Even if the ideas are good, I mean, we ought to be electing policies and then selecting the people. Right. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you what obstacles did you run into, but you've already answered that question. It seems that they, they threw up a lot of roadblocks on you. A lot of, uh, you know, Vermont diggers, the worst, they would just say such mocking things, and it was so easy to do, you know, like uh, I, we'd have be having side chat about, about my animals, and I'd, you know, say, oh, you know, and they'd make me out as, like, I'd talk to the animals, and, you know, which now is getting to be a better thing. <laughs> but uh, they just would, uh, and, and they, you know, at that time, I wasn't dressing in all black. I was, had skirts and things like that. And I found in 2014 that um, I went to some sort of club to talk, a Rotary Club or something, and a man came up to me afterwards, and he said, well, how do you expect, expect to be elected dressed like that? And I had sort of an Indian, you know, a kurta and type thing. Mm -hmm. And then when I moved to wearing all black, um, people would pay attention to what I was saying better. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to remove all sort of elements of, of femininity, which, mm. which I had more of back then. Mm. That's interesting. Um, what I issues do you feel are most important? And what, did any sort of surface this last election cycle? Was there anything that seemed to dominate uh, the narrative? You mean uh, uh, in the what's going on? Yeah. Well, uh, the the um, the pandemic narrative, which can be totally opened up to scrutiny and shown to be uh, really shallow, that that it was almost impossible to penetrate. That I mean, I only got five minutes in in VPR. Was it? Yeah. You know, so to, to reach people about um, what a false narrative it is and why and where the information is coming from, uh, you know, the doctors and to reach people about the level of censorship of doctors. This mm -hmm. is, you know, our freedoms of speech is our, is our primary freedom. Mm -hmm. The capacity to dissent, to question authority. And so it... The, of course, the election cycle, according to the mainstream news, was really about, you know, how are we going to be safe? How are we going to lock down? How, oh, my God. You know, and there even was a, a seven days article that said, are we, are we better off? Are we economically better off with Phil Scott? I just, it just blew my mind mm -hmm. because this man <clears throat> has shut down our economy. And they're asking the question. Uh, it's just, uh, we talk about it all the time, about how uh, people, um, they must, we, we, we imagine that maybe, or I imagine that maybe they f don't uh, feel strong enough in their own unique uh, 
uh, intelligence, their own unique perspective or intuition, and they feel like, well, they are doing it. They must know more than I do. So I will, I will surrender to whatever their narrative is. But uh, you know, if I give a message to you, you know, honor whatever it is your your intuition is, and and go with that. Well, I can tell you that um, when it comes to exposure, he got he didn't even have to advertise or get our buy time. He right. had his, his twice weekly. Uh, press briefings or whatever they were so right. that automatically gave our governor you know a huge advantage as it was That's right. although not all of it turned out the way he liked do you <laughs> uh, have an example where it didn't I, I can't go into it here but I okay. will after the show okay uh, I can also tell you that um, when it comes to rigged elections do you remember what happened to Ralph Nader in 2000 yes we won't go into that but that's another whole story and how he was essentially locked out of the presidential debates Mm -hmm. And he couldn't even get in the building. They told him he would be arrested if he tried. And he bought yes. a ticket. Yes. He bought a ticket to get in, and he wouldn't. But and anyway. they, they've been doing that since, you know. And, mm -hmm. and the, with uh, Ron Paul, of course, the when Ron Paul came through, mm -hmm. there were they were apparently uh, riots, not the big ones like, but there were fights outside of the caucus stations because of the people not following ru the rules. They did it to Bernie. They did it to to Ron Paul. Mm -hmm. um, so the the you know, it's, it's, it's correct not to trust this outcome, not to trust uh, government per se, because mm -hmm. their, their, their higher power, again, we've talked mm -hmm. about this before, is, okay. is not humanity or God. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the money, it's money as a personal power instead of God mm -hmm. as, as a personal motivator or however you want to put it. Yep. Source. Well, uh, you don't get any argument out of that uh, from me. Tell us about the People's Inquiry. We talked about it briefly before the show. Please explain it to our listeners. All right. Well, uh, we are working on uh, a number of uh, legal approaches to cope with the the violations of Constitution, the you know total abridgment of our freedoms, and the false narrative. Um, you know, that there isn't emergency and wanting to prove it and why, you know, not wanting to. So one of the problems is, is that uh, even if we win in court and there are other states whose governors are being uh, proven in court to have violated their constitution, and there's a big Ohio case where uh, they uh, have, they're challenging whether there is an emergency or not, and it's moved into discovery, which is a big deal. But the problem again is, is whether the public sees that. So most of what happens in court is is pretty sequestered and the public doesn't see it until the outcome. Or So we've been brainstorming. Uh, there's a lawyer, there's a couple lawyers and we're meeting on Zoom around the state. And the, the result is, is that we want to conduct a people's inquiry. And for that, we're gonna need people from around the state uh, to participate as sort of an ad hoc jury. So we're going to need commitments from people who are willing and will do it on Zoom to, to show up at a certain amount of time on a routine mm -hmm. and listen to evidence and then be willing to be interviewed about what, you know, how, how they responded to that evidence and at the very end to uh, make a synopsis. Uh, and then we will present this as a show. Um, so they, they need to be willing to be seen and be part of and to talk with the other people. So in order to, uh, so we're, we're seeking people who are, you don't have to believe one, or, you can believe in COVID or not believe in COVID. You know, we should have a balance of people to see the evidence that has not been reported by mainstream and to uh, make, a, make an assessment of it for others. Yeah, there seems to be uh, a lot of information that doesn't make it to the headlines. Uh, for example, I, I happen to notice uh, our local newspaper, whenever there's a case, and now there was one death in Orleans County from COVID, they actually didn't even say it was from COVID. They said it was with COVID. Yes. And, and uh, it, yes. If you look, at, and I've been going through this because I've been preparing legal papers. So if you look at the, uh, the Vermont um, a chart, Right. of yep. COVID deaths so far, now there's 59, you'll see that there's a number of them that, number one, 
weren't even confirmed COVID. Number two, their primary cause, secondary cause, third cause is not COVID. Mm -hmm. And some of them were, you know, obviously uh, pacemaker failed, you know, yeah. type thing. So the, it's, the numbers have been duplicitous. And then uh, let's talk about the test, the duplicity of the test. Yes. So yeah. you, the, the maker, I don't know his name offhand, he said it should never be used. The guy got a Nobel Prize, was it some sort of prize for making it, the, the test, but he said it should never be used for diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And then, so what they do is they, they take a, they cycle, I don't know whether it's uh, centrifugal, but anyway, they cycle the, uh, and, and you can cycle it anywhere from like uh, 10 cycles up, up on through, but when you get to like 33, 35, and we have a clip of Anthony Fauci saying this, when you get to a cycle of, of, of 35 or so, what you're doing is you're amplifying the material. And if you amplify it enough, everybody has traces of coronavirus. Everybody does. So that's the positive test. And that's why New York Times says that 90% of the tests are false positive. Now, what's, what's really problematic is the FDA states that you should be cycling this test at 40, I don't know whether it's RPM, but at 40, um, and that, then that's always going to be a positive. So, you know, finding out what you have as a test, but then finding out what they cycled it at is yeah. really important. I mean, there's, there's so many problems uh, with this idea that cases are sick people. They aren't sick people. The health people, healthy people, in many cases, maybe even 90%, they're false positives. So, and, and then every flu season, mm -hmm. Vermont has an average of 87 deaths of flu. That's e right. e even more of tuber tuberculosis, you yeah. know, which is a communicative disease. And now we've doubled, almost doubled our suicides because, you know, so you go on and on and find out, you know, how shallow this premise really is. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's so, uh, it's so much, it's so important for us to empower the people to to think on their own and to say yes it's all right to question it you know when you question it you really you're really being patriotic well i think that i think that leads to an, to a, another whole discussion and it's that people uh, I, there was a song i can remember the name of the band a long time ago they did a song called give me convenience or give me death <laughs> and it seems to, it seems to be that we like convenience. Yes. And if we have somebody taking care of us, some big government agency taking care of us, we seem to feel safe. But I, I personally don't when government gets that intrusive. Um, I was going to ask you here, how do you feel about um, government mandates? For example, the uh, state of Vermont has mandated several things or tried to mandate several things. And most people think that a mandate means it's automatic law, but that is not the case. Can you explain that difference? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I just, uh, you know, stood up to my voting place uh, about the mandates because I, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to vote without a mask and I wanted to vote inside. And what I was explaining is that, number one, the mandates are not law. The governor has no power to make law. And we have a window of time before the legislature comes in because the legislature could pass law based on the government's governor's mandates, which they may very well. Yeah. That's why I think it's very important to file a suit now. Um, and they're also up to a lot of other good, no good. But the mandates, uh, within the mandate, he states that um, people have, uh, if, they, if they're doing exercise or if they have any reason whatsoever, that they can't tolerate a mask, then they don't have to wear one. But then he's very duplicitous because in the very next line, he says businesses can refuse re refuse service to people, right. and really they can't lawfully. Mm -hmm. They can't lawfully refuse refuse it. But he's given them the feeling like they can. And then you go around, you see places that have signs that says, uh, the our co-op says. You have to have a basket or a cart and a mask. It's the law. And the reason the basket and the cart is they want to keep track of how many people are in the store so they only have a certain number of baskets, a certain number of carts, so they know if they're all empty. 
They, they, nobody should be in there. And it's not the law not to have, have a mask, mm-hmm. and certainly not a law to wear a mask. But uh, you have to, I mean, we've been wondering how to approach this. And um, some of the things is also uh, helping people understand that the, the, the mask is, the, the virus is this 0.25 micro, 125 microns, and it's just like smoke. So, mm-hmm. if it, so it's just coming out the sides, coming out, coming through. It, the masks are absolutely useless. And we have you know, WHO and all these other people and all these different tests which show that. Mm-hmm. So um, it's not as if people without masks are endangering people. Actually, people with masks are endangering themselves because mm-hmm. the first thing we need is oxygen. So there's you know a lot of work, and I really want to refer the the uh, viewers to a film called The Great American Mask Ripoff by Dr. Blaylock. Uh, he's a neurosurgeon, and to um, Dell Big Tree, The High Wire, which is a news service, uh, very good news service, and lastly, the, the Corbett Report. Mm-hmm. Um, are you thinking of running for office again? Uh, I've done it for a decade, okay. and I find in my life I'll do something for a decade, and the next decade uh, we are actually we're on our way over to look at a, pe- at a piece of property, and we're... Um, we're going to work on a, uh, uh, it might be called Permacultural Farm School for Everyone, Freedom School. I want to help um, initiate the sort of, their, their hybrid environment of schools, residential, and guest lodging. So we're learning how to live in community. We're creating the kind of communities where the kids can be safe to run around, where the elders can be uh, have purpose until they die, where the natural world is what we engage in, and uh, I believe our health will soar, our happiness will soar, our creativity will soar. So I'm um, absolutely thrilled about that. Might write a book. Okay. Might, you know, we'll do this people's inquiry. It looks like I have to file a suit. So that's what I have ahead. I don't want to run again, and I'll tell you why, because this time... The ball is the big ball has started rolling. People are meeting. People are beginning to do the people's assembly. And as we talked, that article in in our Vermont Constitution, that we have the right, the indefeasible, indubitable, and unalienable right to reform our government when we see fit. You know, there's a, there's a at least three thousand people, probably six thousand people, who want to do that. Now, just beginning to organize to do that. If we got to 30,000 people, we'd have the legal chops and the, uh, the, uh, the uh, mechanical chops to deplatform the de facto government that we have for the unlawfulness. So that's, um, that's what we're headed towards. They don't need me. When it comes to businesses uh, enforcing these mask mandates, do you find any particular area worse than any other? I have my own take on it, but I'll let you do yours. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, Wyndham County is awful. Uh, you know, the the co-ops are worse. And what's very interesting, if you go in and you say, you know, do you have a doctor's uh, license? Do you have a license to uh, practice medicine? And this is a medical device. And do you are you indemnified? Do you have insurance? If I fell over from a lack of oxygen, you know, would you cover that? So there's there's a lot of things but so I think I answered your question just down south in Burlington and and you know Montpelier yeah Wyndham would be down near Brattleboro it's the places where you have what you would think is the most academia right it's so strange because uh, they they've they've really abandoned uh, looking at alternative news or even asking them themselves like there's a place that has a uh, has a curfew now at night is it Massachusetts? Massachusetts. Massachusetts? Massachusetts was going to go do that from uh, 10 at night till 5 in the so morning. So what? So what? Does does COVID come out at night? I mean, does it come out especially? So, you know, <laughs> there's just, it's, it's, too, it's too nuts. And then the government is completely closed. You can't even get in the doors that we're paying for. And then mm. 
you know, you go, go to the store, these same people go to the store, and they say that mask works, but you can't wear a mask into your own government offices. Mm -hmm. It's really, the safety is a euphemism for them to operate in secret, and they're not doing good things in secret. Well, you, you just said something that, that, that piqued my, uh, uh, something that I just noticed. You talked about academia yeah. and how it tends to be very repressive this, rather than progressive. Um, I noticed the last time, the last two times I've gone to Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, I drive right through Hanover and there are signs that you have to wear a mask even outdoors. That's so crazy. In, in Hanover, New Hampshire. It's so stupid. And I believe it's in Woodstock, Vermont also, but I haven't, yeah. I don't know yeah. that for a fact. Now, yeah. if all of these mandates and all these lockdowns and quarantines and masks and uh, social distancing hasn't worked, what is their excuse really well they want to they want to continue the the fear of because as people are fearful and i and i do i don't know how many minutes we have left about two or three two or three okay i want to get to this point that um uh, my friend tino was bringing forward um they they want to keep us fearful and you know it's very difficult for us who are quote unquote awake that see because we see this agenda and we see so many people uh, seemingly obeying it and we're concerned for the health concerned that they're taking a vaccine where the uh, the the vaccine trials the placebo is not a saline placebo it's a meningitis vaccine mm -hmm. so if if they if somebody has a bad reaction please go to Dell Big Tree the high wire learn more and one thing that we were talking about is about energetically if we are energetically in fear then we have a very very low vibration so if we can find things that uh, raises up into the the energy of courage and then the energy of of creativity and of joy those are very high vibrations so if we can be in that state despite all this we will either uh, sort of cancel out or uplift other people. So that, that place of courage is a higher va vibration than that place of subservient fear. So having courage, what I do is I'll go into a place if, I, if I'll carry my shield, but I won't automatically wear it. And then I, I may get confronted. And then I'll assess by the situation, you know, might be in a bookstore that I want to talk to the person, the person's wearing a mask and he doesn't want to lose their business or whatever. But the state has absolutely no right. It's just that they've stolen the right, if you will. Mm -hmm. And and people uh, need to stand up. And if we talk about, we haven't even gotten into the 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 election fraud. Uh, you know, the widespread. We know just on the surface, fifty percent of the people are are unhappy. You know, but mm -hmm. they the, there's. The outcome that the media says isn't necessarily the honest outcome or the real outcome. And it's been interesting. You know, the whole thing's been a very, it's a very interesting time to be here. Well, maybe we will get to that the next time you drop by. Thank you, Terry. Okay, I want to thank our viewers uh, for watching. This is Terry DeFazio for Dial It Up. We will catch you guys on the flip side. Have a good day.